Well, good morning again to those of you in here, and good morning to those of you who have joined us from our other campuses, and I can already sense your disappointment. Uh, After that guitar number, you're like, now we got to hear from a guy wearing a pool liner for a shirt. Oh, uh... (laughs) And uh, if, uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, I'm Bob King. I'm the campus pastor at our, at our East Paris uh, campus. And uh, this is a fun week uh, for us in the King family. Uh, our youngest child and only daughter, uh, she turns 16 next weekend. So my little girl has her sweet 16th birthday. So we've got a little bit of, a, little bit of fun planned. And uh, 16 years old, of course, she is looking forward to getting her, uh, her driver's license. And I know uh, in different states, uh, the laws are different and through different times, but how many of you, when you uh, were 16, you were driving? Okay, a whole bunch of you. And uh, something that uh, we're particularly proud of her, uh, this summer she got a, she got a job. Uh, she's nannying in our neighborhood three or four times a week for a, for a family. And uh, how many of you, when you were 16, you, you had a job? Okay, bunch of you. Uh, now, if there is something, well, something we're a, a, little, <laughs> a little disappointed in, uh, she's turning 16, but she is not yet leading a multi-million dollar international organization. So uh, how many of you at 16 were leading a multi-million dollar international organization? N- no, nobody. Okay, bunch of uh, under, underachievers, I guess, huh? Because uh, as we open our Bible teaching today, a 16-year-old is leading a multi-million dollar international organization. Our story begins in 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 26. And uh, part of the story is found there in your program. Uh, but we begin reading in verse 3. It says, Uzziah was, how old's this guy? 16 years old when he became king, king of Judah, and he reigned, and I think this is really the impressive part, he reigned in Jerusalem how many years? 52 years. For over half a century, this guy was the king of, king of Judah. With the kings that we've been looking at, he is the longest reigning king, the longest reigning good king. And uh, we've entitled this series, if you're just joining us, entitled it uh, Good Kings. And to give you a little bit of uh, orientation to the time period we're talking about, let's take a look of a, of a map here. Uh, God's people, the children of Israel, they have made their way out of Egypt. They have gotten into the promised land, the land that God promised to them. They have settled there. They have taken possession of it. And then they started looking around at the nations around them And God's people decided they wanted to have a king just like all the other nations. Uh, The first king was Saul, the second king David, the third king Solomon, and then civil war happens in the nation. Uh, The Israelites are divided into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. And in this series, we've been taking a look at some of the kings during this period of, of time. Uh, these, uh, these two countries together, Israel and Judah, both of them make up God's people. Uh, between the two of them, there were 43 kings that reigned. <laughs> of the 43, only nine of them are considered to be good kings. Now, a good question to ask if you're just joining us for this series is how do you know he's a good king? Well, the uh, the author of this part of our Bible, First and Second Chronicles, gives us a little clue of uh, if the king is a good king or not. And listen to what uh, he writes about Uzziah. It says in verse four, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. Uh, that phrase there, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, is only said of, of nine kings, only nine out of 43. All of the rest, we would read a line that says, and he did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Nine good kings, and King Uzziah is the longest reigning of all the good kings. 52 years. Now, I don't know about you, but I am often drawn to to longevity. And one other thing that our our author tells us about King Uzziah continues down in verse, verse five. It says, as long as he sought the Lord, so kind of a conditional statement there, God gave him success. 
long reigning king, a king that had some measure of success. And I don't know about you, but, but I'm always drawn to success stories. I'm drawn to people who have longevity. I think of a couple at their golden wedding anniversary, a couple in their, in their 70s. I'm like, how did, how did they do that? I mean, with all the, the twists and turns that, that life can take, uh, the challenges of, of raising kids, the, the hurt that couples can inflict on one another, how did they, how did they make it to a golden anniversary? Or I think about a family business. It can be hard to get up each morning to figure out how in a very competitive environment to to turn a profit. And this guy, he's been leading the family business his whole life and about ready to turn it over to the generation that's behind him. I'm like, that kind of longevity and success, how how does he do that? You have these uh, sports stars that are at the top of their game heading into their 40s. How how do they do it? I want to know how to have success over a long period of time. And as we explore Uzziah's story today, we're going to take a look at, let's call them three acts in the drama of Uzziah's life. Uh, Three acts in the story of uh, Uzziah's success. Now, uh, we know that he was uh, successful, but the question is, what was he successful in? Well, that brings us to act one. Act one of Uzziah's story, I just want us to explore his, his prosperity. Now, as, uh, as we make our way through this, it uh, might sound like I'm droning on and on about the things that, uh, that he did. And the reason for that is that, well, I'm, I'm droning on and on about the things that he did because he accomplished a lot of things. And as we take a look at this, uh, this first section, what I want you to listen for is just listen for all the people groups that are mentioned in this, in this section, okay? Here we go, this is found in verse six. It says, he went to war against the Philistines, there's our, our first people group, and broke down the walls of Gath, Jebna, and Ashdod, so three cities in the Philistine area. He then rebuilt towns near Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. In verse seven, God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Ger Baal, so it's second people group there, and against the Munites, a third group. The Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt because he had become very powerful. Now, a bunch of uh, people groups mentioned there, and uh, just to see what's going on, let's go back to, to our map. King Uzziah is king of, of Judah. He has conquered some Philistine cities. He's pushed his way toward the Mediterranean Sea. In fact, Ashdod, one of the cities mentioned, is only three miles from the Mediterranean coast. If I were a, a guessing man, I would say he made his way all the way to the coast, and he now has seaports along the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the Munites live down this direction toward, toward Egypt. He has pushed the boundaries of Judah way down to the, to the south. And it's not mentioned in the, in the verses that we just read, but if you look just before a couple of verses, it tells us that he also captured a city called Elath. Elath is on the Gulf of Aquaba, right on the, on the Red Sea. He has a seaport in the south as well. Uh, the, Ammon, uh, the Ammonites are in this blue area. It sounds like he has pushed the borders of, of Judah this direction toward the Ammonites and they are paying him, him tribute. What Uzziah has done here, he hasn't just simply secured the boundaries of Judah and expanded them. There's a major trade route called the International Coastal Highway that he now controls through this area. By going this direction, he controls a second highway. It's called the the King's Highway on the far east side of the the country. The seaports, the trade routes, people are paying tariffs into Judah. The economy is increasing. Phenomenal things are happening in Judah by the expansion of the boundaries. Well, it's a that's great that he's pushed the borders out, but what is he doing inside the country? I'm glad you asked that because we read more about Uzziah's prosperity. It continues 
in verse 9. It says, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem. That's the capital city of, uh, of Judah, his country. Uh, he built uh, towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the angle of the wall, and he fortified them. Uh, artist rendition here of uh, the city of Jerusalem. We're not exactly sure what the, what the city limits look like. So just envision this with me for a second. Uh, gates that he built towers around as you enter the city. It mentioned some main gates, some corner gates, but all these towers are, are going up. You know what this means for, for Jerusalem? <laughs> Jerusalem is a, is a protected city. If you're an international businessman and want to bring your trade into Jerusalem, this is a safe place to do this. If you're a banker, (laughs) your capital funds are safe inside this city. The economy is increasing in Judah. Okay, that's wonderful if you live in the city. Uh, What if you live in the country? Well, he pretty much did the same thing there. We read as the story continues. He also built towers in the wilderness. The the wilderness is protected and dug many cisterns. There's water for livestock. Now livestock can increase because more water is available. Uh, He dug many cisterns because he had much livestock in the foothills. He has sheep, he is producing wool, he has goats, he is producing cheese, milk from, from cows, continues in the next verse. It says he had people working in his fields. He is employing people, working the fields and vineyards in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil, grapes, figs, wheat, Olives, olive oil, wine. This guy is absolutely prosperous. 52 years, he is, uh, he is king in Jerusalem. He must have great diplomatic skills. He's got to have phenomenal leadership skills. I mean, this guy's got to be smart for all this to happen because Uzziah did all of this, Right? As this section ends, we get a little bit of a clue of how Uzziah accomplished this. We read in verse, back half of verse 15. It says, his fame spread far and wide for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. And the question is greatly helped by who? And we had that clue a little bit earlier in in verse seven. It says, God helped him in all of his his exploits. Yes, Uzziah is smart. Yes, he's probably a phenomenal diplomat, but Uzziah had some assistance in accomplishing all this. Now, I I think there's something vital for us to to understand here. And uh, for us to, to capture it, I wanna introduce you to someone uh, this is Don Prize. Uh, Don used to live uh, in, in Ada. Do you even know who Don Prize is? Okay, couple of hands. Uh, Don Prize is a, is a local artist. Uh, he owned the uh, Grand Gallery that used to be in the village of Ada and the Grand Gallery down in the, in the Amway Grand. Uh, several years ago, Don moved out to Utah where he continues uh, do, creating his art uh, there. He is one of my favorite local artists. Uh, we have several of his paintings in my home. In fact, I brought one of them uh, with me today that Jacob's gonna pull out here. Great, thank you, Jacob. Uh, this is a ginormous picture hangs in my master bedroom. It's a terribly disproportionate to the, to the room. It like swallows up the, uh, the entire room. I don't know where this scene is, or I don't know the name of this, uh, of this painting, but it looks like to me that it's gotta be on the lake shore of a uh, Lake Michigan somewhere, maybe like where Duck Lake or another uh, river may come into, uh, into Lake Michigan. Now, I want, to, want you for a second to, to pretend with me. All right, I want you to pretend that this, this painting can talk. And imagine what you would think if you heard this painting say something like, uh, look, look at the color palette I used. Look at these neutral tones and then how I used some red to give it a, a pop of, of color. We, we go, well, that's kind of odd painting that you would, you would say that. 
Or what if the painting said, look at, uh, look at the brush strokes that I used. Look at these broad brush strokes up here to give you the, the feeling of vastness in the sky and these quick brush strokes down here to give you texture in the, in the landscape. We go, painting, what, what are you talking about? Brush strokes that you did. Or what if the painting said, look at even the frame I selected, how the, the color and the, the shape of it kind of, kind of looks like dune grass growing in the, in the landscape. Painting, you picked the frame. Painting as beautiful as you are <laughs> and as much as you light up my room, you don't get credit for that. Who, who gets the credit ultimately for the beauty of this painting? Don Price, the artist, gets the credit for the beauty of this, of this painting. Uzziah was greatly helped. He was gifted. He was skilled. But he was also greatly helped. And I think this is important for us to remember. You all have a skill. You have a gift. You have something unique to you. Some of you are incredibly intelligent. Your teachers, your professors, you use that intelligence in your workplace somewhere. Uh, yes, you, you have developed that, but ultimately, who gets the, who gets the credit for that? The, the, the heavenly artist gets the credit for that. Some of you are quiet and introspective, enables you to, to reflect and think deeply upon things. Who, who gets the credit for that ability? Some of you good with your hands. You can tear anything apart and put it back together. Yes, you've continued to work and develop that over the years, but who ultimately gets the credit for that? The heavenly artist. It's important for us to remember who gets the credit for our gifts, for our skills, and for our accomplishments. Um, there's another good king. Uh, his name was, was David. He was the second king in, in Israel. I think this might be what, what he's trying to say as he reflects on, on himself. Uh, we read in a song that he wrote in Psalm 139. He says, for you, God, <laughs> you created my inmost being. Everything that I am, what I have, you created that. And he used artist, craftsman language here. You knit me together in my mother's room. You made all that. And who gets the credit? David says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And in this first act, as we see Uzziah's prosperity, we need to be reminded that our accomplishments, the things that we have done, ultimately, God helped us, and he gets the credit for that. Now, here's the thing. What's the danger if we don't do that? What's at risk if we fail to acknowledge that God is behind our giftedness and, and our accomplishments? Well, let's continue Uzziah's story. Continue reading in a chapter 26 and in verse 16, it says, but after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. Uh, this brings us to act two of Uzziah's story, uh, Uzziah's pride. Uh, pride, pride fails to recognize what God has done. In fact, pride says, you must recognize my greatness. <laughs> you must recognize my accomplishments and my superiority. And this is how this plays out in Uzziah's life. One day, uh, Uzziah makes his way to God's temple in Jerusalem. He walks right into the front doors of, uh, of the temple carrying a censer. 
And of course, a censer, you put incense in it, you light it, and as the smoke comes up, it's a symbol of one's prayers going up to God. Have a a cutaway here of the temple to kind of visualize what Uzziah has done. He's made his way inside to the temple, right to the altar of incense, and a little bit of a close-up picture here of the inside, and has knelt down and is getting ready to offer the incense and the prayers to God inside the temple. There's one problem with that. (laughs) Kings were not allowed inside here. Only one group of people was allowed to go inside the temple. Only priests, the workers at the temple, were allowed inside here. Uzziah has done something God forbids. And Uzziah walks in and there's a bunch of people following right after him. We continue reading the story says in verse verse 17, Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord followed him right in. They, um, and what's the next word there? They confronted, they confronted King Uzziah and said, it is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests the descendants of Aaron who have been consecrated, they've been specially prepared uh, to burn the incense. Leave the sanctuary for you have been unfaithful and you will not be honored by the Lord God. Uzziah has walked in to the temple, has done something that God forbids, and now he has been confronted about what he has done. I want us to press pause for just a second on Uzziah's story. Let's let's leave him right there with this confrontation that has just taken place. Because right now, Uzziah has a decision to make. He's done something God forbids. He's been confronted. And now we wonder, how will Uzziah respond? Because there's a variety of ways to respond when we're we're confronted, right? Right? Uh, let's, uh, let's start a little bit lighthearted here. Men, uh, follow me into the car. <laughs> you already know it's going to go bad, right? Uh, we're in the car, we're driving, and, and your, your dear, lovely wife has the audacity to suggest that you might be following the car in front of you a little too co- closely. You've been confronted. Now you have a decision to make. How will you respond? <laughs> And there's a, there's a variety of responses. I mean, you could, you could let off the gas and, and drift back a little bit. Uh, you could respond like this. Um, have I ever been in an accident? I mean, if we're keeping score, who in this front seat has had more accidents or more tickets? Oh, I haven't done that. I've heard of a friend who, who did that because I, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say something like that. Uh, you could get aggressive. Uh, it could even get a little passive aggressive. Not say anything, hit the gas a little bit more, creep a little closer to the car in front of you. But there's a variety of responses, right? Men drivers, uh, ladies, ladies, follow me. Uh, let's, go into a, let's go into a women's small group. Uh, while the small group is, is going on, there's, there's one lady in the group that she often brings up her previous church and her, her previous pastor. And when she does, there is a little bit of an edge. Uh, the sarcasm is, is a little bit sharp. After small group one time, her leader kind of pulls her aside and says, Sherry, Sherry, it, it sounds like you've, you've got a little bit of, of hurt from your, your previous church. And, and I'm afraid that that, that hurt is, is turning to, to resentment and into, into bitterness. Sherry has a decision to make. How will she respond? She can respond with, you know, you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, I was was wounded and I don't know how to process that. Sherry could also respond by bailing. She can find herself a new small group and she can find herself a new church. How do you respond when you're confronted? 
engaged couple decide that they're going to they're going to move in together future brother-in-law knows of this and uh, he discreetly pulls the couple aside he says to them you know this this doesn't honor god and in fact it's just the, the practical part of 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 controlling your urges before you're married cuz you're going to need that time and time again after you're married they have a decision to make how will they respond? They can respond with, you know, you're, you're right. Yeah, well, we got to figure out different arrangements here. They can respond by getting defensive. By going, I don't think you understand our culture anymore. And I don't think you understand just, just how practical it is for us to save our finances and not be renting two different places. How do you respond when you're confronted? Because you know there is a response that God is looking for. Um, our good King David mentioned before. David did something God forbids. He had adultery, committed adultery with a woman, and then in a cover-up scheme, he put his put her husband in the front lines of a battle and had him, had him knocked off. David was confronted about this. And David wrote another song about his response to that confrontation. David wrote in Psalm 51, my sacrifice, oh God, God, what, what I bring to you, what I offer you is a broken spirit, a broken spirit and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. The response God is looking for when confronted is a heart that's broken, that is soft, that's tender and, and willing to change. And I want us to press play on Uzziah's story. <laughs> Because Uzziah has done something God forbids. He has walked into the temple with, with a censer. And our good king Uzziah, he, he's a good king, right? He's going to respond with contrition, right? His story continues. In verse 19, Uzziah who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry. The volume intensifies. He's getting agitated. I imagine him pointing his finger. I hear him saying, who are you to tell me what I can do? I am the king of Judah. Do you see all that I've accomplished? I will offer my prayers and I will offer my incense in here if I want to. His arms are flailing. His face is turning red. A vein is popping out in his forehead. <laughs> and that's not the only thing popping out on his forehead. Because the priests that are looking at him and their eyes are getting wide. It says in verse 19, while he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, Leprosy broke out on his, on his forehead. White spots are starting to form across his, across his skin. The, the, uh, the priests, they see this and it continues in verse 20. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead. So they hurried him out. This brings us to act three of Uzziah's story. Uzziah's, Uzziah's punishment. The priests, they see what's, uh, what is happening to him and it's, it's as if they grab him, they lift him right off his feet and they start rushing him outside of the, out of the temple. And um, in what I think might be one of the, one of the funniest verses in the, in the Bible, it says, uh, indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had inflicted him. It's like he sees their eyes. He feels something on his forehead. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm out of here and starts taking off as, as well. This is act three, Uzziah's, Uzziah's punishment. Now, um, 
I wanna take a hard left turn here. Uh, I, I, don't be, I don't wanna be too trite, but there's something vital for us to catch here. And uh, in order for us to catch it, I, I, I think we, we should play a little game, all right? You guys wanna play a game? All right, let's play a game. Let's play pick a can, all right? Here we go. We're gonna play pick a can. Get my cans set up here. And of course, to play pick a can, I need a, a contestant. So uh, let me have a, a name here. Uh, Chris Wheland. Chris Leland, Wheland, come on. Oh, right in the front row. It's almost as if we had this planned. So Chris, come stand right over here. Uh, Chris, uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for helping out. And Chris, you're on our, our medical team yes. here, at, uh, here at church, right? Uh, we, have a, we have a group of, of volunteers that uh, come from uh, uh, professions like EMT or nursing uh, physicians who actually volunteer their time and all our, of our campuses and our weekend services in case there's any, uh, any medical emergency. So thank you, Chris, for serving there. In fact, can we just thank all of our uh, medical personnel? <laughs> And uh, Chris, uh, remember those kind words uh, because of what I'm about to do to you here. Uh, this is how pick a can works. Uh, we have three cans up here and uh, we've covered the labels on all three. Uh, Chris, you're gonna pick a can. You can pick can number one, or you can pick can number two, or you can pick can number three. Now here's the twist. You pick a can, I will open a can, and you have to take a bite of whatever is inside the can. Now, uh, now Chris, before you select, do you wanna know what we went shopping for? Uh, he says, no. Uh, uh, we, uh, we purchased some peaches, uh, we purchased some spinach, and uh, we purchased some, uh, some dog food. Oh, I know. All right, so Chris, let's play pick a can. Which can do you select? Oh, do you don't, does it say something on there? Okay, he picks can, can number three after trying to cheat. Here we go. Gonna open the can. Oh, oh, that's brutal. All right, he selected spinach. So here, I hear the groans. So here we go, Chris. Um, all right, I'm not gonna make you follow through with it. All right, there we go. Let's, let's give Chris a hand again. Thanks, Chris, appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Here's the thing. Chris got to pick a can, right? But he didn't know what was going to come out of the can. This is exactly what happens to Uzziah. Uzziah has decided to do what God forbids. He's picked his can but he doesn't get to control what comes out of the can. And for Uzziah, it was a skin disease. It was leprosy. My friends, this ought to send shudders up our spine. You can pick a can, but you have no idea what's gonna come out of the can. Think of a guy whose life is absolutely out of balance. He lives for the almighty dollar. He goes to work early, he comes home late, and even when he is at home, he's not really at home. He's picked his can, but he doesn't get to control what comes out of the can. Maybe family life goes fine, Maybe it doesn't. Maybe his daughters grow up and they leave the house and they go, you know what? Dad wanted nothing to do with us growing up. We don't need to have anything to do with dad now. He misses out on future interaction with his daughters and grandchildren. Picked his can, but he didn't know what was going to come out of it. Think of a guy who's sleeping around, doing something God forbids. He can select which tin can he wants, but he has no idea what's gonna come out of it. An STD, a 
pregnancy and paying child support for the next two decades for a son he rarely sees. He can pick his can, but he doesn't control what comes out of the can. Woman in her late 40s says it's all right to have a, have a few drinks, but then she has a few more and then a few more. And God desires self-control and moderation and she's picked her can. Maybe she makes it home safely. Maybe she gets a suspended license. Maybe she gets in an accident that devastates another family. You can pick your can, but you don't know what's going to come out of that can. And just listen to the cascading consequences that come out of the can for Uzziah. Verse 21, King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, limited interaction with family, limited interaction with friends, living a life of isolation. He was banned from the temple of the Lord. He does not get to participate in community celebrations. He doesn't get to go to annual festivals. He can't offer his worship and his sacrifices to God. The consequences continue. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. He no longer governs by himself. He's in a co-regency now. He has to lead the land through and with another king. And even when he dies in verse 23, Uzziah rested with his ancestors and was buried with them. (laughs) No, he was buried near them in a cemetery that belonged to the kings. He misses out on a state funeral. He doesn't get to be buried with the other kings of Israel. He's buried in another cemetery. And then it ends for the people said he had leprosy. After King Uzziah dies, how is he remembered? Well, people said he had leprosy. He's remembered as the the diseased king. Uh, King Uzziah, the king who rebuilt Jerusalem with towers and made it prosperous, he's remembered as a king who had leprosy. The people don't remember his produce and his sheep and the milk and the cheese. He's remembered as the diseased king. Hey, do you remember Uzziah? They don't remember the wheat and the olives and the expansion of Israel's boundaries. He's remembered as the king who had leprosy. Was Uzziah a successful king? Maybe success isn't determined by what you accomplish in life. Maybe success is determined by how you're remembered after you're gone. How do you want to be remembered? Parents, those kids aren't going to be in your house forever. They're going to move out one day. How do you want them to remember home life, home life after they're gone? I want them to remember that mom was, was stable. That mom was a, was a rock in the house. I want to remember that the dad was gentle. Yes, he, he disciplined, but he, he did it with kindness. I think success is defined by how you're remembered after you're gone. 20-something, <laughs> you're not going to be in that apartment forever. And middle-class person, you're not going to be in that neighborhood forever. 
How do you want to be remembered after you're gone? Want to be remembered as people who didn't talk about others in the neighborhood. Want to be remembered as people who, who served their neighbors. You're not going to be in that job forever. How do you want to be remembered after you leave it? Want to be remembered as someone who brought a strong work ethic every day. Someone who practiced integrity in the workplace. How do you want to be remembered after you're gone? Because success is defined by not, not by what you do when you're here. Success is defined by how you're remembered after you're gone. And I think that pathway to success starts with realizing that any of our gifts, any of our accomplishments ultimately come from a great artist and a great creator. Successful people are people who have a heart that is contrite when they're confronted. When they make a mistake, and, and they will, go, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that. How, how can I make that up to you? And successful people are people who avoid sin because you have no idea what's going to come out of that can. My deepest prayer for you is that you are successful neighbors, you are successful employees, you are successful coworkers, successful schoolmates, and that you are well remembered after you're gone. Stand in here and in our other locations and let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Goodness was expressed by sending Jesus here to forgive us. And for that, we say thank you. And Heavenly Father, uh, we need your help in being successful. Give us stamina to do what's right. Give us wisdom to make good decisions. And help us to be people who have soft hearts and hearts that are molded to be like yours. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you next weekend.